large resource in the Great Plains. That happens because a bunch of things uh, in the uh, weather patterns and the Rocky Mountains and all this perfect storm happens to create these high winds in the Great Plains. Um, but just we'll, we'll take it as that. We have really good winds. Um, for this talk and, and the way that we often look at this, we split the country up by regions and it's not red and blue states. It's not agriculture versus industry. It's, it's kind of how the winds blow. And so we talk about the different regions of the country and we, we sit there in the interior where by far the best resources sit. So I'll, I'll refer to that as we go along here. Um, so just to talk a little bit about the growth of wind, just kind of do a snapshot today. And this is this is a recent report that came out um, just re, uh, at the, uh, I think it's uh, two or three months old now, that the Department of Energy does. Each year they do an update on kind of where we are with wind technologies. And what we can see is we've got about 84 gigawatts of wind capacity in the United States. Now that's just a big number. So let me put it in some perspective. The entire state of California, which remember is the ninth largest economy in the world, you has a 50 gigawatt system. So we have installed capacity that's about 1.6 times California's um, power, okay, um, that they require. So that's not an insignificant amount of power. Um, wind energy is the largest source of renewables of past hydro. Um, just recently, it produces now over 6% of our electricity, which is up from, um, I would say it was a trace in, in 2002, 2003. So that's in a very short time, a very large increase. Um, and in 2015, we passed uh, the rest of the world. We produce more wind energy than any other country. Now, interestingly, we don't have more capacity than any other country. China has much, much more capacity. And to give you an idea, last year China built 23 gigawatts of wind in one year. So it's very likely that China will pass us in um, production as well. But we have better wind um, in, our, in our wind sites than, than China does often. Um, again, you saw this uh, similar plot from Rob when he was showing it. And it just shows the percentage of different types of uh, electricity and what's happened. And so. Uh, what we find is uh, a very rapid change in our sources of electricity. We saw the very large increase in gas, which is in the, the light blue there. Um, and this isn't quite as recent as Rob, so it shows gas higher than coal. Uh, but you see the, the very rapid drop of coal from about 57% of our electricity in the early 80s before natural gas really started to take off to now about 31%. And again, I'll point to the 6% uh, in the uh, magenta down there, which is wind, which you can see didn't exist really before 2000. Um, so that's, that's one interesting thing. Um, another one here is the capacity additions. What is being added to the grid? That's actually probably more of an important thing than what's on the grid, but what are we adding? So if you look at this chart, kind of the, 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 the beige color is natural gas. So natural gas has been the big addition since about 2000. And actually that big spike around 2002 is why Wyoming was really happy about natural gas prices in the mid 2000s was that very rapid development. But then gas prices shot up. So what happened? Less gas development. And then you start to see the blues kick in where you really start to see them as about 2006 and then peaked in 2012. Um, but you can see in 2016, it's almost a third, a third, a third. Wind, solar, natural gas with a little bit of blip down below of other development. So what's being built by the companies is, um, is, is due to this, uh, um, is due to this desire of, of the, uh, the utilities and uh, the power consumption to use these resources. Um, the other thing is the cost of wind has decreased very rapidly. And again, Rob's, uh, Rob's shown this already. But I'm just gonna show you again, this is a different chart for the same idea. Here's wind here, left is better and cheaper. Um, and the hash lines are with subsidies, but the non-hash lines without subsidies. So the idea is if that went away tomorrow, we would still have sufficient uh, economic gains in terms of wind to keep it as a very, um, very attractive for development. Um, I'll skip over this one because it's the same thing. So what's, what's behind that, you know, that cheap cost? What's happened to the drive of wanting to use this? And it's really technology. Um, Department of Energy has invested, as have the uh, equipment manufacturers, the big turbine makers, um, have really invested a lot of money in trying to drive down the cost of energy. They realized very early 
You know, it's, it's really nice that people say, I like wind, I want to have wind, but it's much easier if you can say, wind's economically the, one of the better decisions to make. So they've been really working to do that. So one of the things that's happened is this is the capacity factor, and just to define capacity factor, the capacity factor is the amount of energy you produce compared to what you would produce if that turbine ran at full capacity 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 a year, okay? So an outstanding capacity factor would be about 50%, all right, of a, of a, for a wind turbine. Um, a moderate capacity factor would be, you know, something in the, these days would probably be considered in the low 30s. You wouldn't want to do much if you weren't unless you're in the low 30s. But we can really see what's happened since the kind of the start of what I call the modern era of wind in the United States. We've gone from capacity factors in the mid-20s to capacity factors in last year that were over 40%, okay? So that means that that turbine is producing about 160% of what that same turbine produced just 20 years ago, okay? That's huge. How many industries do you get that kind of improvement in? in a short amount of time, and that's why this is happening. Um, this is just another plot that shows why that's happening, what, what's the technology things behind those improved capacity. So on the left here, we have the average nameplate capacity. That's how big is the turbine generator. Inside there, there's a generator. That generator can only produce so much power, and that's when we say a one and a half megawatt turbine, it's got a one and a half megawatt generator in it, okay? So we can see that we were, we were doing about uh, 750 kilowatts or three quarters of a megawatt was kind of the standard size in 1998. Last year, the standard size was up, about 1.9 years in the, um, oh, excuse me, it's, a, it's up here, 2.2. So over two megawatts. So that's a three times in size of what was being installed just 20 years ago, less than 20 years ago. Um, the other thing we can tell you is what's happened with that is the average rotor diameter, the rotor is the blades, and it's the diameter of the blades there, has gone from being, you know, down here in the 50, it's this, uh, it's this, this uh, circles here, it's gone from being down here at about 60 meters in diameter to 110 meters in diameter. This thing is over a football field length in diameter. I know sometimes it's hard to get a sense of scale of these machines, but they're huge, they're enormous. And as I'll show, they're just gonna get bigger. This gives a sense of that, all right? So we're sitting here, remember, we're just about two and a half megawatts. Uh, we'll probably be what the average is here very soon. And you're looking at an 85 meter diameter here. We're headed towards, and that's, that's a little bit low, it's probably more like 100 meters because of, of low wind areas. But we're headed towards these 120, 150 meter diameter turbines. So just for reference, there's Air Force One, okay? Uh, a Boeing 747. These are enormous, enormous machines. Okay, so this just shows that change in kind of a, a picture. You can think of the colors as constant size turbines. And so we see the blues were kind of the standard, and then they left, and then the reds, and then the greens, and then the purples. And now we're going to rotors that are 110 to 120 meters in diameter. Just showing how technology has really moved to enable this. And what happens with that is the cost drops. Um, fewer turbines to service, the size of the rotor at interacts with more air, produces more power, and the blades have gotten more efficient, the drivetrains have gotten more efficient. It's just a, it's a technological uh, story that's just fun to tell. Um, and the world is noticing, okay? It's not just the U.S. So the U.S. is down here, you right, I'll find this here somewhere. Uh, there we are, right here. This is in terms of percentage of energy we produce, okay? Remember, we're the number one producer of wind energy, but the country uses a lot, right? So you go to countries like Denmark, which has penetrations of over 40%. That's the average, yearly average amount of power that was coming from wind in places like Denmark. But you can see we've got a ways to go to catch up to these countries that have really, really had this large penetration. Um, so, Again, this is uh, it's a good story. We're doing well, but we could do better if we continue moving on. So let's talk about where wind is in the U.S. quickly, so we know kind of where we're dealing with um, in terms of Wyoming and elsewhere. So this is just a map of all the wind plants. Each one of those little circles doesn't say, uh, and these are by basically regions or 
areas where they're actually what we call balancing authorities or operators. So MISO, you can think of this as the Midwest. That's Iowa. Actually, it stretches all the way from the Canadian border to Louisiana. Um, they are the leader. They are producing an awful lot of uh, wind. SPP is right next to them, ERCOT in Texas, and then you can see kind of everybody else. So it's that kind of that eastern side of the Great Plains is where a lot of the development has gone historically. Let's switch for a little bit. Um, along with building out, one of the big kind of things to go after was, hey, if this is a new in industry, let's go after manufacturing, right? So these are where wind turbines are manufactured in the country, okay? And it's kind of interesting because again, you see here's this great part of the country for actually producing wind, and much of the manufacturing goes on elsewhere. Well, that's partially because of the where manufacturing goes on uh, for that reason. But it's also, you take a look at little spots like the, the Denver area has really gone after and tried to attract some of these uh, wind turbine manufacturers, developers. There's an awful lot of activity in Colorado um, on that. So again, these are opportunities we'd like to see potentially with wind development, some of that come to Wyoming. So this is just a summary, and again, it's really is inadequate transmission or good resources that we could use if we had transmission. Positive influences, what we've been talked about. Low <laughs> cost of energy, right? Um, corporate demand, really interesting. It's the Googles and the Facebooks of the world are saying, we, we want electricity, but we want it from renewables, okay? We can't ignore that. That's a, that's a, it's a demand and supply, right? If somebody demands that, the customer wants that, we've got to listen to that. Um, RPS policy is still in force, some growing, you know, we, we hear about California, they always are kind of the, the leader, so they go make the mistakes before the rest of us do, right? But they're talking about 50, 80, 100% renewable portfolio standards, okay? Where will that take us, okay? New transmission, and we're going to hear a lot about that here um, over the next couple of days. Um, those are going to be, uh, those are going to be important things. And then the last one there on the bottom is kind of this working thing that's out there that's called electrification of transportation. Most of the experts, and again, as Rob said, any prediction is always wrong, but the estimates are sometime in the 2030 time frame. There will be a flip, and all of a sudden, we will be building more things that run on electricity than run on internal combustion engines. If that occurs, all of a sudden, we're going to have a large increase in demand for electricity. Where is that going to come from? So those are forces. All right, and then transmission development. Where are we with that? Um, taking a look at kind of, you know, this is kind of a current state of transmission where we see, and, and this is if nothing really went different, these are kind of the darker red lines of things we have to build out by 2050. If we go to an aggressive renewable energy type of uh, approach, then we see we get much larger of these large lines, and these large lines are moving energy from where it's inexpensive to produce to the load centers. So if we're going to go with a very, very aggressive, renewable type of picture, there is going to be a lot of transmission development. And as Rob talked about, transmission is really tough to develop these days because of crossing many jurisdictions, permitting, the investment required often before there's any return, many, many years of investment. But that's kind of where we're going to go. We're going to hear about some, some of those projects. Um, so again, I think I'll skip over to that quickly. That's just showing what's happened. So let me kind of transition. That's kind of the national kind of a, um, a spotlight. And, and often I'm working with national groups, so I have to talk about the more general problem. But today I get to come home, and I get to talk about Wyoming. And when I'm on the road, I do brag about Wyoming's wind resource. Remember the purples were kind of the good wind on the big map? We didn't really see reds and blues. Like reds and blues, like scary wind, OK? Um, and we have lots of reds and blues. And you can really see it's really going from the northeast corner to the southwest corner. It's that lower half of the lower right-hand corner, if you want to call it Wyoming. That's where our wind resource is. And these are our existing wind plants. Some over here in the southwest corner, a group of north and uh, east of Casper, uh, the development in northern Albany and, and eastern Carbon County, and then some over here in the uh, Cheyenne area. So you've driven past these things, you know where they are. But again, that map doesn't look real full compared to some of those areas like West Texas and Iowa, correct? So the idea is, what's, where are we right now? Well, we have 28 installations in Wyoming currently. 21 of those are greater than 10 megawatts, so I consider those significant size. And sometimes it's multiple 
uh, like three or four 10 megawatts will equal one real 40 megawatt plant, but I didn't break that out. So as Rob said, 1,490 megawatts roughly installed. Um, the earliest commercial plant in, in Wyoming, when I say commercial plant, of sizable, we had, we had some, some other turbines that were, have been here since the 80s that were, were research turbines and runs as ones and twos, but the first large wind farm was installed in 1999 out at Foot Creek Rim. You pass it every time you drive to Rollins on I-80. Um, those are small machines, 600 kilowatt machines um, compared to today's. Uh, and then Rob told you, 80 megawatts uh, has been installed in the last seven years. Basically, we haven't installed anything. And that that uh, plant, the 80 megawatts, was last year. Um, the most common supplier, just for truth, General Electric supplies more of the turbines in Wyoming than any other. Um, and again, they're clustered in those certain areas that we talked about. Um, so, uh, skip over this. No, I guess I'll, I'll talk about this quickly. Again, we have our own negative influences in the state of Wyoming. Um, as Rob said, there, why did we not develop for six years there? What was a combination of things? Lack of transmission, policies, um, lack of need, okay? You're not going to build new plants if you don't need more electricity. And Wyoming is a net exporter. That's important. We already ship electricity out of state, so if we're going to add more capacity, it's going out of state right now. So we have to have a market to send it to, and if there's no market, there's no, no need to send it. Um, positive influences, again, we've talked about, we have fantastic resource, probably the best land-based resource um, in the country for sure, and, 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 and probably among the best in the world. Um, proximity to the West Coast, remember I talked about the break in the, the grid happens right about here. We are the closest good wind, outstanding wind, I should say, to the West Coast, where the load centers are. So that positions as well to perhaps serve serve the West Coast. Um, the drops in costs, again, have affected us. Changing attitudes, um, you know, the idea that when we had a conference about 10 years ago talking about the same thing, uh, wind was new, it was different. It was, you know, kind of the unknown. It was, it was scary, right? Well, now we've seen other states build out, and again, Rob's talked about this. This hasn't been California just putting in a bunch of wind, though no, they did, but it's Iowa, it's Texas, all right? It's Kansas, it's Oklahoma. Other states have done this and, and been able to, at least within their state, achieve a parity between what they want to achieve and, and what they don't want to give up. So there's a possibility to do that. Um, and the other one, obviously, is new transmission, and we'll, again, we'll talk a lot about that over the next couple of days. So I just want to kind of go quickly through some of the projects. I'm not going to talk about these very much because they're going to be talked about um, by the, the folks that are developing them, and they'll do a lot better job. But again, when I go on the road, I get to talk about what Wyoming's vast resource is and what things we can do. So the largest wind farm um, currently in the Western Hemisphere at, at planning stages is the Joe Terry Sierra Madre um, uh, development. It's 3,000 megawatts or three gigawatts. 1,000 turbines, all right? Um, but it's not the only big project in Wyoming. We've got the, the Veridis Eola project that's gonna be now, that number's a little old, it's actually over 2,000 megawatts. Again, this will actually occur um, up in Shirley Basin. Um, Chocchari Sierra Madre, of course, is south of Rollins. Um, but those aren't the only project. There's several other projects that are in the making, and I'm not listing everything, I'm just kind of doing a, a quick list, but there's several others that are going to be developed in Carbon County and Albany County that add up to an, over another gigawatt, all right? Um, and then Rocky Mountain Power has recently announced that they're going to be upgrading 900 megawatts of existing uh, power in the state, wind energy, and then looking for another 1,100 megawatts. Now, some of that may be some of these other projects, but as Rob said, there is a lot of development going on which is why this is so timely at this point to have this discussion. Um, but I do want to say, we talk about our outstanding resource, but I want to go back to that U.S. map. We're not the only ones that have great resource. And the other thing is technology development has actually come to the point where it might actually hurt Wyoming. And then what is happening is wind's getting so good, it's becoming profitable to operate it in much lower wind resource. And I'll just point this out. This has been the average capacity factor, okay, all right, or the wind quality resource 
that where things were built. And you kind of see it's been, we've gone to lower, but then we're back up here recently building a higher wind resource. The wind's being built right now in that interior region. But look at the planned projects. There's a big job drop in the, in the, uh, the wind resource. Why? Because it's being built elsewhere, all right? So we don't have a window to say, well, let's wait another 10 years and see what happens, okay? Because technology will probably be at a point in 10 years where it's going to be very, very effective to build it elsewhere. The other place I want to point is offshore, all right? Not competitive right now, but we brought our first offshore wind farm online in 2016 off of Block Island, Rhode Island. Six turbines. Each turbine is 6.5 megawatts in size, okay? That's about three times the size of the average land-based turbine. Okay, so there will be competition there. Right now, it's a little expensive, but we plan particularly on our building wind in Wyoming is not going to affect our coal industry. What is going to uh, happen is if we don't develop wind in Wyoming, it's just going to be developed elsewhere. All right, it's, it's needed, it's wanted by other people. We don't affect it, it's market demand. Other states decide what gets used. But unfortunately, we're a net exporter. We don't make that decision. We serve as customers, if you want to think of it that way. Okay, um, just for two minutes, I want to go through this quickly, and I'm not going to talk about all these individually, as I hope, because I'm running a little long. But basically, what are the challenges if we want to go towards a significant area, um, significant amount of renewables? Well, the first one is, this is a picture here of all the balancing authorities in the West, and I don't remember the number, but it's over 30. 33? Thank you. See, we have somebody knowledgeable that's great about this audience. Somebody here will know the number. So we have 33 balancing authorities. And you think about it, we're trying to move wind and from the from the Great Plains into California, we're trying to take solar, move it this way, we might take hydro and move it this way. It doesn't work real well when you have 33 different groups trying to balance things locally. So there's a move afoot to try to make these balancing areas larger. If you think about something like the Midwest Independent System Operator that runs a grid that extends from Canada to Louisiana, those are the kind of areas that you actually do better when you try to integrate um, wind and solar and renewables um, on the grid. Um, we need transmission. Again, back to this chart. Where are we going to build transmission to provide that critical ability to move power around, all right? Because the kind of bottom line is if you make, make power, you want to use it if you can while you make it. That's the most effective way to do it. So making it, transmitting it, and using it someplace else is the first thing you want to do. Right now, the grid was not built to do that, all right? And so we need to add transmission that allows us to move power around more effectively. Um, another topic, incentivize change in electrical consumption habits. This is sometimes called demand response or other things. We expect that when we turn on the switch, we're going to get lights and we can put a load of laundry in and set the dishwasher to go. The idea is as consumers and as in industrial consumers, maybe we can tailor our electricity use more to when electricity is really available. When the wind's blowing really hard, you're throwing in extra loads of laundry in your waiting to have your dishwasher run until things come on, or in the future, charge your car when the wind's blowing more or the solar sun's down, all right? So there's gonna be options in terms of how we change our behavior, and we need to incentivize that. We need to make that a win for the customer, not a burden, okay? And then the final one, after all those things, then you add storage, all right? Storage, as it turns out right now, is expensive. It, do it doesn't meet the huge needs we need yet. We're working in that direction. But you do these other things first, then you add storage, and then you have a robust system. All right, I'm just going to skip over some slides here so I can finish up. These were all just the details of those things. So um, I just want to talk about this is happening in places, OK? Um, Mid-American Energy uh, services Iowa, a little bit of Nebraska, I think it peaks over into Illinois even a little bit. Um, it is a Berkshire Hathaway company, much like Rocky Mountain Power is here. Um, in 2004, they had 70% coal generation and no wind. Today, they have 46% wind serving their, so they're at Denmark levels serving their customers. And they are on their way to add 2,000 megawatts within the next five years, and they'll be at 89% of their 
resource is from wind. Now, how can they do that, right? Well, they're part of MISO. Remember the big balancing authority that stretches. MISO allows them to move power around when they're producing too much, it goes out and services other areas, and when they need it, it comes in. And it's not just, you know, fossil fuels that are doing the vacuum of their wind, it's renewables from Minnesota that are coming down into, into Mid-America's area when they're doing it. So they are really looking at that integration issue, how do we do that, all right? So again, there's examples of how to do this. Again, it's not a technology issue, it's whether we want to do it or not. All right, last slide, I promise, and I'm done, and then it's, I'm holding up coffee yeah. break, so. Um, I would say the time appears right for development in Wyoming. It looks like there's kind of a, 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 a uh, large group of projects that are kind of all coming to fruition at the same time. But I think we all want to say that, you know, now I'm talking more as a citizen rather than a technology development. I, I approve of development, but I want it done carefully, and I want it done well, and I want it to have the economic impact it can for the state. Um, if we decide not to develop, it's not going to stop wind. Let's just be clear about that. Wind's economic. Policy out of the federal government, state governments, has only a little effect on this, all right? It's going to happen. So the question is just where is it going to happen? Um, and then the last thing I want to leave you with is from an economic perspective, I think Rob hinted to this a little bit, but I believe that building the wind plants is just the first economic impact we can have. Once we demonstrate we can build large projects and serve up large amounts of renewable, inexpensive electricity, remember, this is the cheapest place to build renewable wind in the country, that it can track economic development itself. Data centers, other electricity intensive industries want to come to places where there is lots of inexpensive electricity. And just to leave you with one fun fact, by 2020, data centers will consume 10% of the world's electricity. So when you take out your cell phone and you hit that Google search, realize that that's fueling that need. And with that, um, I'd like to wrap up. And Rob, did you want to, anything else? I think it's coffee break time, and uh, thank you for listening.